black wall tires. They blend into the pavement. But these white wall tires, they say, look at me. Here I am. Love me. You know what? Enough said. I didn't think I would ever reach this point, yet here we are, an episode devoted to the White Wall Tire. Welcome everyone to episode 33 of the Automotive History series, where we roll through the history of the White Wall Tire design. Of course, the history of the White Wall Tire cannot be told without going slightly into the history of its black counterpart. Wheels used to be made of wood. Carts and carriages had wooden wheels when Moses still wore short pants, and continued to do so around the start of the 20th century. In the late 1800s, the first rubber tires were invented so to make the ride of the carriages, bikes and early versions of cars more comfortable. But the rubber use for the tires led to a very limited drivability. It didn't have the desired grip. And in an effort to make the tread better, a white powder named zinc oxide was added to the tire and made them completely white. So by the start of the 20th century, most cars featured all white tires. But why do we associate car tires with the black color? Well, that happened some 10 years later. The all white tires had better grip but a very limited lifespan. And a new process was invented called vulcanization. By adding carbon black to the white tire, it greatly improved the tire life and made the tire entirely black or partly black with the surface that touches the road black and the side white. <laughs> And so the stage was set. The poor would drive on entirely white tires and the rich could afford these new all-black, long-lasting, low-maintenance vulcanized rubber tires. But isn't that strange? Usually it's the opposite. The black tires are the standard and the white walls are the luxury option. How did that happen? By the late 1920s, plenty of luxury cars still rode on all-black tires, but something somewhere switched the opinion about the color. White walls were getting increasingly popular again as a luxury option, instead of all-black tires. How so? I couldn't really find an answer, so I'll come up with my own explanation, which is very much questionable, mind you. Black tires didn't need as much maintenance and are easy to wash. White wall tires aren't. In fact, a lot of work goes into maintaining the crisp whitiness of the white wall and the tiniest cuff would damage the virgin white. But what if people eventually saw this as a bragging right? Oh, you have regular black tires? <laughs> Me? No. I have white walls. I can take care of my tires properly. I am willing to spend time and money on maintaining my tires. Who knows? Anyway, some way, somehow, the white wall tire was back in vogue, as people found the contrast between the black pavement and the white tires look stylish, and the reverse happened. And so, the stage was set once again. The poor would drive entirely black tires, and the rich could afford these new, shiny, cool-looking, contrasting white wall tires. And the car industry jumped in on its increasing popularity. Because you should know that the existence of the white wall tire, or really any tire design, is based on nothing. Really, there is no science. It is all based on design, style and emotion. It looks cool, but nobody can really explain or justify why. It's pure marketing, a status symbol, sucks every last penny out of your pockets. Hi, welcome to Ford Motor Company. How can I help you? Yeah, I'd like to order a 1955 Ford Crown Victoria, uh, the hardtop special deluxe, please. Sure, you want some white walls to go along with that? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, why? W what does that do? Oh, nothing. They only really contrast nicely with your two-tone body, that's all. They don't serve a specific need? Not at all, sir. Sold. By the 1930s, the white wall was gaining ground. Every car maker, whether expensive or not, added white walls to the option list. From the most expensive Duesenberg to the cheapest Ford, white walls were right there for the taken. And so, the craze directly affected the design. The whiteness of the white stripe became wider and wider as the 1930s and 1940s progressed. It became an unofficial contest who could get the whitest white wall tires. And by the late 1940s, some car makers offered cars with almost completely white tires, like this 1948 Chrysler right here. It offered a nice and cool looking contrast to the deep color paint of the body and gave it an air of luxury. 
These are the days that the white wall was still pretty much a premium option that was one way to show you had some extra money lying around. Your car could have all the high-tech options of those days, like air conditioning and automatic transmission, but you can't see that from the outside, now can you? But the white walls, hmm, were a distinctive option to show you had made it in life. Look at me! Here I am! Love me! And that brings me to a little anecdote. A while back I read an article about the video game L.A. Noir, which lets you play as a detective set in late 1940s Los Angeles. The article was about a guy whose grandpa worked for the L.A. Police Department during those years, and he wanted to show him the game to see if it was accurate or not. His grandpa stated that the game truly was accurate, except for one thing. Police cars don't ride on white walls. There was no use in that. Police cars are almost always base trim versions, and they gain nothing from having white walls. Sure, they contrast nicely with the black-white police livery, but that's it. And I thought it was a neat little detail. Anyway, I'm going slightly off topic here. By the start of the 1950s, wheel design reached an all-time high. No longer the hubcap was a simple chrome piece, better known as the so-called dog dish. Car makers offered a wide variety of intricate wheel designs, even showing the body color on it. And so, how the pastel color combo looked nice on the body, so did it on the tires, thanks to the white wall. It was the continuation of the car's color scheme. But by the late 1950s, the white wall was subject to change. Around this time, the longer, wider, lower movement had started. Cars became, well, you guessed it, longer, wider and lower. What visually didn't help were thick white walls, and in order to appear less tall and slimmer, the white line became narrower, and some car makers even tried to hide the white wall behind fender skirts. Over the course of a couple years, the white stripe became narrower. This trend was arguably started by the 1958 Cadillac Eldorado Brougham, an ultra-luxury car. Many cars followed, and by the start of the 1960s, many cars still featured very elaborate wheel designs, but now with a modest stripe of white. By 1962, the craze of thick white walls had faded and was diminished to a single stripe. But was the white wall about to be forgotten? Not at all. The slim strip white wall remained, but was joined by a new generation of colored wheels. By the mid-60s, the performance era had started with the introduction of performance-oriented pony and muscle cars. These cars certainly didn't want to be associated with luxury and didn't get the white wall treatment, but something different instead. Whereas we associate white with luxury, we associate the color red with passion, my channel and power. Many muscle and pony cars came with performance tires that featured a little red stripe to further complement its sporty image. Some cars even offered different colors. There was also a gold stripe offer and blue stripe offer that would complement the body color without painting the rim. And then there were sports cars that had some white action going on on the black tire, but it's not a stripe. White letters spelling the tire company started to appear that is once again a reference to the cars on the racetrack and also reinforced the sporty image. In the meantime, the popularity of the general white wall was waning. Reduced to a slim stripe, only luxury cars with a strong focus on traditional styling still featured white walls. Think of long-lasting Lincoln and Cadillac models, but not your typical Mercedes. In the 1970s, the full-on white wall tires saw a brief resurgence in popularity as a result of the aftermarket pimpmobile culture, but that's about it. By the 1980s and 1990s, the white wall tires started to disappear altogether. As soon as the popularity dropped, it became increasingly harder to justify the production, since white walls are harder and more expensive to make. Only very few American luxury cars still had a slim white stripe, but much of the other luxury car makers dropped them. The white leather tires, once common on performance cars, made a shift towards SUVs and truck vehicles. By the 2000s, white wall tires were completely gone, save for some very last holdouts. Think of the conservatively styled luxury sedans like the Cadillac DTS, especially when it's a Hearst or limousine, and the Lincoln Town Car, arguably the very last car to offer white wall tires as standard. 
And so is the white wall tire dead? Not exactly. No cars are offered today with white wall tires from the factory, that is. When you look at the aftermarket business, the white wall is still the cornerstone. Especially tire companies that used to make white walls back in its heyday continue to do so today, so that you can fit your classic car with a proper set of period correct tires. And then there is a group of individuals that want to modify modern day cars to look like the days of yore. And usually it's grouped with also installing a custom grille and fake vinyl top, like this one right here. And here I am with my sick fantasies. Here is a quick and dirty Photoshop done by me, where I shove big white walls under a Chrysler 300, and I generally think it looks fantastic. Because what other cars do you think look cool if they rode on some nice whites? Let me know in the comments.